Hello everyone. Hello classmates. Hello Dr. Gregory Poyo. I am about to report about the topic hypothesis and assumptions. So our learning objectives are number one, explain what hypothesis is and what assumption is. Construct at least two hypotheses that might be investigated. Number three, illustrate two advantages and disadvantages of stating research questions as hypotheses. And number four, differentiate between directional and non-directional hypotheses. So now, let's begin. What is a hypothesis? The term hypothesis, as used in research, refers to a prediction of results or of the possible outcomes usually made before a study commences. So it explains that before the event happened, we already come up with a spe speculation of the results or the outcome of the event. And I've also gathered a definition from Oxford languages. Number one definition, a hypothesis is a supposition or proposed explanation made on the basis of limited evidence as a starting point for further investigation. And the second definition states, a proposition made as a basis for reasoning without any assumption of its truth. For example, here is a research question followed by its restatement in the form of a possible hypothesis. Number one, will students who are taught history by a teacher of the same gender like the subject more than students taught by a teacher of a different gender? The hypothesis is, students taught history by a teacher of the same gender will like the subject more than students taught history by a teacher of a different gender. So if the teacher is the same gender with the students he or she is handling, there's a possibility or there's a speculation that the students will like the subject more than students taught history by a teacher of a different gender. If all the students are female students, suppose or the hypothesis is all the student all the female students will like or will prefer a female teacher as well and number two questions how do teachers feel about special classes for the educationally handicapped the hypothesis is or are Teachers in XYZ school district believe that students attending special classes for the educationally handicapped will be stigmatized or will be condemned or will be brand or will be discredited or will be denounced or will be stereotyped as for their uniqueness or Teachers in XYZ school district believe that special classes for the educationally handicapped will help such students improve their academic skills. They believe that the students with a educationally handicapped will improve their academic skills, especially if the way we they handle the the education of these handicapped students will going to be a beneficial exposure to their confidence, for example. And then we go to the definition of the assumption. An assumption is something that you assume to be the case even without proof. For example, people might make the assumption that you're a nerd if you wear glasses even though that's not true. Now, let's know the advantages and disadvantages of stating research questions as hypotheses. The first advantage 
is a hypothesis forces us to think more deeply and specifically about the possible outcomes of a study. Elaborating on a question by formulating a hypothesis can lead to a more sophisticated understanding of what the question implies and exactly what variables are involved. Often, as in the case of the second example above, when more than one hypothesis seems to suggest itself, we are forced to think more carefully about what we really want to investigate. The second advantage is a second advantage of restating questions as hypothesis involves a philosophy of science. The rationale underlying this philosophy is as follows. If one is attempting to build a body of knowledge in addition to answering a specific question, then stating hypothesis is a good strategy because it enables one to make specific predictions based on prior evidence or theoretical argument. If these predictions are borne out by subsequent research, the entire procedure gains both in persuasiveness and efficiency. A classic example is Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. Many hypotheses were formulated as a result of Einstein theory, which were later verified through research. As more and more of these predictions were shown to be fact, not only did they become useful in their own right, they also provided increasing support for the original ideas in Einstein theory, which generated the hypothesis in the first place. And the third and last advantage, stating a hypothesis help us see if we are or are not investigating a relationship. If not, we may be prompted to formulate one. And then next, we go on to the first disadvantage of stating research questions as hypothesis. Stating a hypothesis may lead at to bias, either conscious or unconscious, on the part of the researcher. Once investigators state a hypothesis, they may be tempted to arrange the procedures or manipulate the data in such a way as to bring about a desired outcome. This is probably more the exception than the rule. Researchers are assumed to be intellectually honest, although there are some famous exceptions. All studies should be subject to peer review. In the past, a review of suspect research has, on occasion, revealed such inadequacies of method that the reported results were cast into doubt. Furthermore, any particular study can be replicated to verify the findings of the study. Unfortunately, few educational research studies are repeated. So, this protection is somewhat of an illusion. A dishonest investigator stands a fair chance of getting away with falsifying results. Why would a person deliberately distort his or her findings? Probably because professional recognition and financial reward accrue to those who, who publish important results. Even for the great majority of researchers who are honest, however, commitment to hypothesis may lead to distortions that are unintentional and unconscious. But it is probably unlikely that any researcher in the field of education is ever totally disinterested in the outcomes of a study. Therefore, his or her attitudes and or knowledge may favor a particular result. For this reason, we think it is desirable for researchers to make known their predilections regarding a hypothesis so that they are clear to others interested in their research. This also allows investigators to keep steps to guard as much as possible against their personal biases.
The second disadvantage of stating hypothesis at the outset is that it may sometimes be unnecessary or even inappropriate. In research projects of certain types, such as descriptive surveys and ethnographic studies, in many such studies, it would be unduly presumptuous or overconfident, as well as futile, fruitless, pointless, useless to predict what the findings of the inquiry will be. The third disadvantage of stating hypothesis is that focusing attention to hypothesis may prevent researchers from noticing other phenomena that might be important to study. For example, deciding to study the effect of a humanistic classroom on student motivation might lead a researcher to overlook its effect on such characteristics as sex typing or decision making, which would be quite noticeable to another researcher who was not focusing solely on motivation. This seems to be a good argument against all research being directed toward hypothesis testing. Consider the example of a research question presented earlier in this chapter. How do teachers feel about special classes for the educationally handicapped? We offered two of many possible hypotheses that might arise out of this question. Number one, teachers believe that students attending special classes for the educationally handicapped will be stigmatized. And number two, teachers believe that special classes for the educationally handicapped will help such students improve their academic skills. Both of these hypotheses implicitly suggest a comparison between special classes for the educationally handicapped and some other kind of arrangement. Notice that it is important to compare what teachers think about special classes with their beliefs about other kinds of arrangements. If researchers looked only at teacher opinions about special classes without also identifying their views about their other kinds of arrangements, they would not know if their beliefs about special classes were if a, in any way unique or different. And then this is the last learning objective, directional versus non-directional hypothesis. A directional hypothesis indicates the specific direction such as higher, lower, more, or less that a researcher expects to emerge in a relationship. The particular direction expected is based on what the researcher has found in the literature from personal experience or from the experience of others. Sometimes it is difficult to make specific predictions. If a researcher suspects that a relationship exists but has no basis for predicting the direction of the relationship, she cannot make a directional hypothesis. For the non-directional hypothesis, a non-directional hypothesis does not make a specific prediction about what direction the outcome of a study will take. I have here a scenario on how to identify whether it is directional or non-directional hypothesis. Compare, for example, the following pairs of hypotheses. Which hypothesis in each pair would you say is an example of a directional hypothesis? In pair 1, letter A, second graders like school less than they like watching television. Letter B, second graders like school less than first graders but more than third graders. And on the pair to letter A, most students with academic disabilities prefer being in regular classes rather than in special classes. Letter B, students with academic disabilities will have more negative attitudes about themselves if they are placed in special classes than if they are placed in regular classes. And on the third pair, 
Letter A, counselors who use client-centered therapy procedures get different reactions from counselors than do counselors who use traditional therapy procedures. And letter B, counselors who receive client-centered therapy express more satisfaction with the counseling process than do counselors who receive traditional therapy. And then let's evaluate which is sample determines the directional hypothesis. In each of the three pairs, we think that the second hypothesis is more significant than the first since in each case, in our judgment, not only is the relationship to be investigated clearer and more specific, but also an investigation of the hypothesis seems more likely to lead to a greater amount of knowledge. It also seems to us that information to be obtained will be of more use to people interested in the research question. Thus, it is a directional hypothesis. For the non-directional hypothesis, we retain the same examples. In, in non-directional form, the second hypothesis of the three pairs above would be stated as follows. First, second, and third graders will feel differently towards school. So in pair one, letter B, second graders like school less than first graders but more than third graders. As stated in the non-directional form, the first, second, and third graders will feel differently towards school. And on the second non-directional form, on regarding on the pair two example, there will be a difference between the scores on an attitude measure of students with academic disabilities placed in special classes and such students place in regular classes. Given that the letter B in pair two, students with academic, with academic disabilities will have more negative attitudes about themselves if they are placed in special classes than if they are placed in regular classes. And on the third explanation in the non-directional form, on the third pair, there will be a difference in expression of satisfaction with the counseling process between counselors who receive client-centered therapy and counselors who receive traditional therapy. Given in the letter B in the third pair, counselors who receive client-centered therapy express more satisfaction with the counseling process than do counselors who receive traditional therapy. In figure 3.5, we give emphasis to the difference of directional versus non-directional hypothesis. On the first given example, non-directional hypothesis, the man will look either left or right. On the second example, directional hypothesis, the man will look only to the left. And on the second example of the directional hypothesis, the man will look only to the right. And then that would be all for my report. Thank you for listening, classmates. Thank you for listening, Dr. Greg. God bless everyone.